So it's a challenge. This, you know, this new uh, new world uh, in terms of the pandemic and the demands, uh, the 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 demand for content that it puts on me. It, it, I I'm, I feel like there's greater demand now to create content, not just books, but other content. Um. Just interviews and, and things of that nature. Yeah, that yeah. That? Interviews, interviews. Um, you know, could be a webinar, could be, um, you know, a, a book talk or uh, a reading of a book. I mean, just you, you know, like they're probably I'm probably doing about two or three, um, three of those things a week, maybe four, maybe four. Some that weeks, is, yeah. So that just works in throughout the day, just whenever you have the time? Or? Right, right. Like I did a school visit today and then um, watched, uh, participated in an author, um, I guess it was about promo promotion and marketing. It was a webinar that uh, Penguin Random House had for, you know, for his authors. So it was just, you know, it was not... Um, I was it was interactive, but it was you know you we no you couldn't see anybody other than the presenters, and sometimes I like to at least see people. Yeah, it's one thing I don't love. Well, there's a lot of things I don't love about the pandemic, uh, but specifically about virtual speaking is if I'm making jokes uh, and I've got more than one person on the other end, I don't know if they're landing. <laughs> right, exactly, exactly, and 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 often in when I do school visits, the poems that I like to share are interactive poems like that, you know, that are, I, I usually do choral readings and you can't do that with, with Zoom and, you know, because of the, there would be a slight lag and also because the kids are, are muted and you can't hear more than one voice at a time most of the time, unless you really know how to do a lot of fancy stuff, which I don't. <laughs> <laughs> I think by the time this is done, we'll all be experts though. <laughs> I know. Do I really want to know all that though? In a way, I, in a way, I feel like I do, but I'm really not sure whether I want to know all that. It's just, I think the more you know about it, a thing, the deeper you're going to get drawn into it, perhaps. Well, do you think that this is something, and we can go ahead and call this the start of the show because I'll, I'll I'll keep it uh, brief and okay. brief and pithy. Okay. Since, uh, you've already done two events today. Um, but do you anticipate when you go back to, you know, whatever the world looks like once the vaccine's widely distributed, do you anticipate that you're going to go back to strictly in-person events or do you, were you, have you gotten used to, to being able to at least be at home? And, well, and no, I do of, like, I do like being at home. Um, in fact, I liked being at home before the pandemic for many years before I, uh, joined the Academy, I worked at home out of my home. And so when I, then, you know, had to began doing the, the teaching and had to have office hours at the university. I kind of felt homesick. I, you know, I always wanted to be like in my little home office. And fortunately, when you're a professor, you don't, you know, you don't have to be there every day necessarily. So it did allow me the freedom to still be, still be at home. And, and then a year ago, uh, I was driving, I was leaving campus and had a car, had an accident. Somebody, it was a, like a three car hit and run accident and I wasn't hurt, but my car was almost totaled. Oh and God. as I sat there, I thought I'm, I'm close, you know, I'm, I'm of the age that I could retire if I wanted to, I could also delay it and, you know, you know social, social security stuff. But anyway, I'm sitting in the car after this accident and it dawns on me, what if this is the last time? Um, no, no. First thing is you don't need to be driving back and forth because I live an hour away. You don't need to be doing this anymore. And then I thought to myself, what is this? You know, what if this is the last time that I teach? Um, and I didn't, I haven't taught, I haven't been back. This is everything shut down after the accident. There was spring break and I couldn't, I had to like, can't, I couldn't, at first I couldn't get back and forth anyway because my car was a wreck. So I couldn't commute. And then you know, here we are a year later and I'm still off campus. So it's, you know, it's been, a, it's been an adjustment and, and some classes I enjoy, I, I, I generally teach online anyway, but other classes like my hip hop class, I really miss the face to face interaction. And What's particularly the ability to, and the, particularly the ability to work on our service project. We have a service project in that class. What's the service project? 
Uh, well, a lot of times it's an event on campus, uh, a spoken word event or a series of spoken word events on campus. Uh, generally, that's what it is. We've also um, partnered with a community organization several years ago that has a mural across the street from campus to document the mural. So that those are a couple things that we've done. This is kind of up for grabs right now. We did. I had I had them do PSAs. Uh, public service announcements last semester about mask wearing or some other uh, issue related to the pan or, or or voter participation. They could choose which one, you know, not not uh, political ads. Uh, I told them, but you know, bipartisan, you know, voter voter participation, civic engagement type uh, public service announcements. So I, I like those kinds of um, activities with my students because they learn they learn some things. And I get to see how their minds work, you know, how they approach the project and uh, the gifts that they bring to the project uh, during the execution of it. And, and it always, you know, so it's an opportunity for me to get to know my students better, I think. Yeah, and you're working with mostly all college students or do you work with younger students as well? Oh, college students. Um, but, you know, of course I do school visits and K to K K through 12 schools, but my um, at the university, I'm just teaching uh, college students. Occasionally, we have we do have two um, early college programs on campus. So occasionally, I'll get a student who's from the early college program, and they are although they are younger, they are already taking college courses. So they you know they finish their um, high school degrees by the end, high school diplomas by the end of. I think 10th grade or the middle of 11th grade, and then they take university courses. Gotcha. So occasionally I get those students as well. And of course, they're highly, they're highly motivated because they're high achievers. They have to, you know, apply to get in that type of program. So, so they want to be there. They're, they're eager to get it done and you're happy to work with them and oh, probably yeah. do some additional good with the, with the public service announcements beyond simply teaching the students, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Yeah, but I, I, um, I do enjoy. That's a course that I created, and it, it kind of ties in with my book, um, "The Roots of Rap," um, sixteen bars on the four pillars of hip hop, because uh, the the curriculum in the course looks at the same uh, elements of hip hop that the Roots of Rap covers: um, MCing, DJing. Uh, b-boying, that's break dancing, and um, graffiti. So those four elements we we uh, look at, in addition to some other elements that KRS One has uh, added to uh, to hip hop. But the book covers that same you know same territory. But the class also looks at um, uh, the spoken spoken words, African American spoken word traditions that inspired and preceded uh, hip hop as well. So we, you know, we, we do text to text comparisons of uh, hip hop lyrics and poems on similar themes, African American poems on similar themes. And we look at uh, the politics of hip hop or the engagement of, of uh, hip hop artists in, 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 pol in the political arena and also um, the influence of hip hop uh, in, on commerce. So it's a it's a popular course, and I love I love it face to face. And I, I hope I'm able to teach it face to face again soon. Well, obviously your poetry is is widely available, and and esteemed audience should be enjoying it now. But have you written uh, any hip hop as well? No, except except that when I started. Um, started writing professionally this would have been in the 70s when I first got well when I first got and when I first got published it was like in probably 82 I mean that was you know the the, the beginning the beginning period of hip-hop and I sometimes I wonder if what I was writing then was really hip-hop but I didn't know where you know I, did, I didn't know where to go with it I didn't see myself as an MC and I didn't hip-hop was in a different phase than you know where I mean, it was more more playful, and my poem, my poetry was more ser was more serious. And then in '82, um, the message came out, and I'm like, yeah, yeah, hip hop. You know, th that was the first you know hip hop uh, song that really did um, incisive social commentary. 
And it's, I mean, it, it was, it just blew my mind, but I still didn't write hip hop. I didn't, I didn't think I was writing rap rather at the time. Cause I wrote, I wrote so much free verse as well, but even back then and, and historical um, poems, poems that had um, historical themes, you know, much as I do now. Well, if you were starting brand new from scratch today, do you think you'd still pursue picture books first? Or do you think that you would start with, um, with hip hop and then maybe branch? Oh, I think I'd start with hip hop. I think I'd start with hip hop. If I had known, if I had known then what I know now, I would have, uh, I would have done hip hop, but I think, you know, the thing that probably would have held me back is that I was shy and I didn't really like to be, you know, in front of people there. I, I did have some opportunities to, to read my work, but I always wanted to like do it with somebody, you know, I was just, you know, I was just, I had that, you know, that stage fright thing going on. So that may, that might've held me back even then, even had I, you know, had I attempted it, but yeah. Now I do it. Now I just put myself out there and do it. Well, you could, uh, I don't know, you could contact Lin-Manuel Miranda and see if he needs a lyricist. Okay. (laughs) Do you need a lyricist? Lin-Manuel Miranda, do you need a lyricist? (laughs) I'm here. (laughs) I'm sure he listens to the show every week. We appreciate your patronage, Mr. Miranda. (laughs) My son loves you. Yeah. 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 So, um, yeah, I, uh, I probably would, I probably would attempt hip hop now because it, it can open up the doors to so many other, um, avenues, you know, hip hop artists have, uh, become, uh, actors and, uh, entrepreneurs and different, as my daughter used to say, different things. <laughs> what great book authors. Uh, somebody sent me 50 cents book, uh, oh, I don't know, three, four years ago. Yeah, authors, producers, yeah, yeah, you know, but yeah, all, yeah, they're they're all over entertainment. So for the uh, uninitiated, uh, I I should mention that uh, I, we're having this conversation about the the the, the path you could have taken in, in hip hop, but I'm talking to you when you've won two Caldecotts now. You just got a, a Newberry honor. Three, three Caldecotts. Oh, I apologize. I skipped one. <laughs> Multiple uh, <laughs> so at King honors. You've had an extremely successful career as is, <laughs> but you could have had the, the the Grammy as well, I guess. <laughs> I could, yeah, I could have been, um, you know, in a a serious studio right now, talking to you, you know, with the padded rooms and everything, and at my house, and you know, in the or in the the uh, media room of my house. Yeah, that could have been the life. <laughs> oh, you wouldn't be talking to me. You'd be talking to Joe Rogan. That would be <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> Yeah, but I mean, it's been wonderful. I mean, this is a career that I, you know, never, never even dreamed of. As I tell kids um, when I'm doing presentations at schools, uh, when I was growing up, even though I loved books and even though, uh, and I loved those books, even though I didn't get to see myself in them very often at all, you know, hardly ever when I was a child, I love books, but I had no idea that the that the authors who were writing them were number one alive, and number two getting paid to do that work. And so I, you know, I didn't know anyone. There was there were no authors in my parents' social circle. At least I didn't know I didn't know them. And and in fact, I don't I don't think there there really weren't any. So you know, it was not a career path that I could have envisioned growing up in Baltimore in the 1960s and 1970s. But it's been, you know, it's just been beyond my wildest dreams. You know, I've got, uh, I've been able to create with my son and uh, to travel with him to West Africa to present and to the Middle East. And it's been, it's been, one, it's been wonderful. So it's very, it's, it's very fulfilling. And I just love the idea that um, I am, because I write nonfiction, I am discovering uh, information that I that I then think is important enough to share with kids, and and kids are reading my books, whom I will never meet, you know, in places I may never go, I, I will never go. So it's just it's amazing to me the power of the written word and the power of 
of picture books and the power of nonfiction. Well, of the, uh, and I, I should apologize to esteemed audience, there's a, a slight delay. Uh, so I'm going to try to avoid uh, talking over you as best I can. Um, but um, I, I wanted to ask, uh, of the readers that you are aware of, uh, what's been your favorite reaction to something you've written thus far? All right. I think that my favorite reaction was when a boy had read my book, uh, Freedom on the Menu, The Greensboro Sit-Ins. And he asked, it, it's about um, segregation in Greensboro, North Carolina, and the lunch counter sit-ins at Woolworth that sparked sit-ins around across the country and eventually, you know, desegregated lunch counters across the country. Anyway, after reading that book, the boy asked, who made that stupid rule? And so, you know, that's the kind of reaction that is, I could not have scripted, but is a to is totally appropriate. And I can say, this is why I write what I write. This is why I write about tough topics for kids because kids know injustice when they see it and kids know the right questions to ask. You know, they will, we don't have to be afraid of uh, sharing these, sharing books about tough topics with kids because kids can handle it. It's the adults that can't handle it. The adult, adults might not feel that equipped to handle the questions that are going to result, but adults will be fine if we just let kids take the lead, you know, with the questions that they ask and, and provide age appropriate answers uh, to those questions. But children, you know, children want the truth and they'll find it out. And when they, if we don't tell, if we haven't told them the truth, they're, they're angry at us afterwards. <laughs> Why didn't you tell me about Santa Claus? <laughs> <laughs> Well, I like Santa Claus. I, I have this theory that Santa Claus breaks in uh, children to, oh, everybody conspired to lie to me for years about this thing. What else are they lying about? It's a right. very powerful uh, lesson early on. It is. It is. Yeah. It is. So how do we, how, what's, what's the best way if they're reading something like I was just, um, I don't want to say enjoying, enjoying is the wrong word, but I was reading and appreciating uh, unspeakable, the Tulsa Reyes Massacre this afternoon, uh, which uh, just came out here February uh, 2nd. Uh, and that is, uh, even you, you repeat this phrase, once upon a time, which I had heard you talk about is, 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 is maybe to be comforting for children, but there are going to be some uncomfortable questions that result after, after that's been read. How do you speak to a child about something so terrible without lying to them, but without, you know, just saying, well, the world is darkness and joy growing up, you know, <laughs> how, 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 how do you answer the questions that are going to come up with, uh, with a topic like that? Well, it would depend on what the specific question, question was. Um, but if they, if the question, this is another question that I've gotten, um, when I, uh, after sharing my books and the question is, well, why did people do that? And I think that's a question that you could probably anticipate that a child would ask after hearing unspeakable. And I'd, I'd have to tell them, well, people did that because they felt that they needed to, to feel better, that they were better than somebody else. And that in order to feel that way, they had to take things from other people and the things that they, that th what they took, sadly, were people's lives on that day and people's homes, but they had that that you know that the, it, it, that it was very it was very wrong. It was a criminal. It was a criminal act, and you know we we must never let hate take us over in that in that way to you know to do an act like that. So, you know, I don't know, depending on the age of the child, I mean, these are kids who are eight to 12, it's for kids eight to 12. So you might, you know, the, sim the simple, um, most simple response is that the greatest threat to white supremacy is black advancement. And, and the, 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 the community, the Greenwood community 
of Tulsa that became known as Black Wall Street, that one mile stretch, that business district, was a symbol of, of black progress and black achievement. And white, the white community felt like they needed to rise up against it and, and, and erase it because they couldn't, you know, it, it proved that white supremacy was a lie. Now say that you have a child who's 12 years old and then say, okay, then this happened a while ago. So I assume that's, that's the past. And that's no longer an issue. But of course, sooner or later, they're going to see the Capitol riot. They're going to see what certain lawmakers are doing to prevent folks from voting right now. How do you answer that question about the continued legacy of that? Well, I think you just tell them that it's that none of this started. It, it, although it didn't start yesterday, it's still going on today. And there's a direct line between the injustices of injustices of the past and the injustices that uh, persist and are reincarnating themselves uh, today. So yeah, I, you know, I would just tell them that the, that the uh, literacy test that Fannie Lou Hamer had to pass back in, in the 1960s is the same, is, is cut from the same cloth as the, um, as the, the reduction of polling uh, of the number of polling places in African American communities today, and the um, uh, voter ID laws and and other voter suppression tactics that are being uh, passed into law uh, in state legislatures across the country. So you know you can you can make the connection. You can tell them that that the Tulsa race massacre of yesterday is is equivalent to even though i mean it, it it is in it it was the violence was born from the same spirit as the violence that that pressed on george floyd's neck you know a knee to a knee to his neck for uh nearly nine minutes and the same the same uh spirit that attacked the capitol you know it's it's that is what happens. The, you know, these things happen when hate is allowed to just to be unchecked, and and hate, hate. You know, when hate does, when hate doesn't die. So, another question this theoretical twelve-year-old I'm imagining might ask in response to that is, "Well, this is terrible. What should I do? What mm -hmm. can I do to fight back against that?" What you can do is to make sure that you are not, you are not consuming hate, and also that you are not generating, em emanating hate. You know, as well, putting putting hate out into the world. Uh, first of all, so yeah, you know, I think we, the first step is to look within, and then the second step is to to when you when you to recognize. Uh, you know these uh, hate, hateful, hateful actions when you see them, and not accept lies about them that try to paint them as something other than what they are. So those, those are those are two things that you know that young people, I think, young people can do. Young people can um, can certainly stand up in their own way for other people, and you know, everybody has to choose their own their own way to do that. Yeah, there's so many questions on, on, on this topic that I want to ask you about, but I, but specifically about the book before I move on, because I want to talk about the, the books. I want to talk about all of your books. You've written uh, just about so many different topics. You must have just endless uh, fascinations for, for different things. I do. I do. <laughs> but I did want to ask quickly about uh, Floyd Cooper, uh, Floyd Cooper, who illustrated the book. Uh, how does it come to pass that his grandfather was actually there at the Tulsa race massacre and he happens to be the person that, that illustrates your, your book? That seems like an incredible coincidence. I know, kismet, huh? Uh, well, actually, when I wrote, um, when I was drafting the manuscript, I contacted Floyd and at, I knew he was a Tulsa native and I asked him if he uh, was interested in illustrating the project. We We had worked together uh, before on um, becoming Billie Holiday, so I knew um, 
you know, I was very familiar with his style. And when uh, my kids were young, I used to buy his books for them. So, you know, I'm, I'm an admirer of his work. And but just because of, of his Tulsa connection, I, I wanted to work with him on on the project. And so when I submitted the manuscript, I mentioned that you know, it would be a package. And that's the way that um, it that's the way it came together. And I did not know at that time that Floyd's grandfather had survived the massacre. Um, and, I, and I never even thought to ask a question. Did you have any relatives, you know, that survived the massacre? Because you really don't, you know, you don't work, really work with the illustrator, uh, the, the um, one-on-one, -on -one, the, the um, editor and the art director, you know, they're the go-betweens. Even when I work with my son, it's, you know, it's, I, even though I can, you know, I can certainly talk to him and get some information out of him and call him about it if I want to, but generally that's not protocol. So Floyd, Floyd and I um, did um, pitch this as a package and Lerner um, brought, us on, brought us on as a package. And I, and I found out when I read Floyd's illustrator's note that his grandfather had survived the massacre. And, but I just knew that he, I knew that he, but I knew, I but I knew that he was going to bring passion to the project because, and, and that he was going to have affinity for the project because he had, had, you know, come from Tulsa. And I just, that, that was really why I, why I enlisted him. Uh, but yeah, I, I just thought it's, his illustrations are so powerful and, you know, certainly his illustrations have given his grandfather a uh, voice that, you know, he certainly would not have had back in 1921. He did, he did tell Floyd, uh, uh, share with Floyd his recollections of of the of the race massacre when Floyd was growing up, and um, um, he's Floyd is so fortunate that his his grandfather shared that with him. And you didn't find out till till it was in the note and the illustrations at that point are done, right? Exactly, exactly, exactly. So I assume maybe there would have been just a little bit of wiggle room if you'd known before to maybe go back and, and add some small, a small piece of that story or <laughs> might've changed things a little bit. Who knows? Yeah. And who knows his father, he, he, he may have drawn his grandfather into, uh, painted his grandfather into, into the story in some way. There may be, you know, a specific, um, I don't, who knows? Who knows? And you have, um, uh, written about uh, plenty of modern figures. You you know you've written what three different books about the Obamas that I saw, uh, right. including one about the, their pet. Um, you're the talking, pet is the most popular of the three. Oh well, of course. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> that makes one hundred percent sense. <laughs> First pooch. It's such a cute little book. I had wanted to write a dog book book so badly, and so when when the um, editor wanted me to write about Michelle. I, I said, and I had already written about Obama, which the editor had also asked me to do. I said, but can I write about a do the dog that they're going to get? She said, yeah, you can write about the dog, too. So I said, OK. <laughs> OK. She should be thanking you. It sounds like you you made more money for the publisher with uh, if, if that one's the most popular. <laughs> um, with uh, with. Some of the progress we've seen, you know, we we were talking, you grew up in the, the 60s, you said, in, in Baltimore, and you didn't have books with characters that represented you, um, other than, I assume, um, books you wouldn't want to read. And now there are not enough books available, but there are more books available by authors of color. Um, there have been um, some some progress that's been made. Do you allow that to give you hope? Does that pull you out when you're writing about the, this history and some of these dark topics that you're covering? Or does that not, would it be better not to allow that to um, blind you to what still needs to be done to all of the injustice that are still very much present with us? Mm, I, I have to have hope when I, when I to, to even write about these topics. Uh, because some of them, there, some of them can be very difficult. I mean, a person, a person who who reads the book, only has to read it once if they want to, right? But if I'm working on it, I've, I've got to do the research, so I've got to take this deep dive into the topic, 
and then also write and rewrite and rewrite and rewrite it and and then go back you know then go back into some of the you know maybe more research <laughs> on the topic so it can take a lot it can take a lot out of me to to create these work these these some of these books um and but so i forget the question <laughs> That's okay. It was yeah, a, I mean, it really, was a nice you know, but really, I'm just trying to give you an idea of, you know, it. It is. I, I almost feel like I put a piece of myself in in some of these some of these books that I've written, and I, you know, I just I approach the t some of the topics with with so much reverence and such a great sense of responsibility. It, um, not only the responsibility that I have to my readers, but the burden of the past that, you know, that, that, and, and the suffering that people, people and people, and my people have endured. So it, it's just, it, it is, it is, it can be very, it can be very difficult to, to write up for me to even write about some of the things that I write about. Um, but then, you know, but then I, you know, I read it afterwards and it's not, you know, I, I have managed to, I think, pull, maybe, maybe like take, almost take the hit for the reader so that it, it's not going to affect, maybe uh, it's not going to affect them, the reader, in the same way that it affects me. So it's not going to... I mean, it, it's not going to inflict pain on the reader. It's going to cultivate empathy instead. But when I write about these topics, I have to, I feel that I have to actually bear some of the pain. That was. Uh, when you, when you do that, how do you separate yourself and, and, and pull that self? I mean, you've got to, you've got to teach, you've got to, you've got to do Zooms, you've got You've got a whole life that you've got to continue on after the, the pain of that research. So when the book is done, I'm assuming you're still doing a bit of research because you're going to go on and you're going to be speaking about it. But when can you separate yourself from it or can you ever? Well, I can't I can't separate myself from it anyway because, at all because it's uh, there's something called race memory. So it, it's race memory. It means for, for those who you know, are listening who may not know is it means that the the memory is in your blood and and so even if i don't know i'm still shouldering i'm still bearing that pain inside of me even if i don't connect with it or know where the trauma is coming from it's still inside of me so it, it i you know i i is that i can't totally you know disconnect from it but that's not because I'm, I have written about it. That's because I am African American, and my people my people lived through it. But I can't, you know, when I'm when I'm when I step out of writing about it, I'm not I'm not feeling that you know that kind of burden anymore because I feel like I have done something about it. You know, the act of writing is 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 for me a political act, and if I have done something about it, then. I can feel better about it because I feel like I have, I have at least exercised some agency, you know, in the situation. And so, you know, so writing about the, writing about some of these topics, you know, reaching back and looking at and, and documenting some of these events uh, and, 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 and profiling some of these individuals, these freedom fighters is my way of, of uh, showing agency and having agency to, you know, to be able to, to, uh, tell these stories. Is, can you foresee, or, I mean, is there a topic that's come up where you said, nope, I can't live with that. I can't, I can't have that taken up, uh, space in my, my brain for however long it's going to be to get a book out. Are there the topics you've avoided? Um, you know, I, I, Actually, you know, there are some other, there's some other events in history and I, I'm, that I wonder, you know, have felt maybe I can't approach that. Um, 
there was, uh, let me give, let me, and, and there are even, when you write about people's lives, you know, if you're writing a whole biography, you don't really have that luxury necessarily to say, oh, I'm not going to deal with that, you know, particularly if it's an important part of the person's life. So um, this is not a middle grade book, but when I was uh, writing Beauty Mark, a verse novel of Marilyn Monroe, there was a, there was a portion of the, of the book, of her life story, of her life where she was in uh, a psychiatric ward for a few weeks. And I didn't want to go there with her in, you know, in terms of the, the writing, but I knew I had to. So I saved that poem for last, even though, you know, even though I, I pretty much wrote everything else in, in, in the story, in, in, the, in, the, in the verse novel, in chronological order. The rest of the poems, I all, you know, wrote them pretty much in the order that the, the things happened to her. But that I, I postponed. Because, you know, you do have to, you know, go there with your character if it's a, or if it's about an event. You have to be at that, in the midst of that, of, of that event that's happening, that incident that's happening. So how do you create that for yourself? What's your process for writing a poem like that or about anything else? Well, lots and lots of research. The more research, the better. Um, I think the, you know, the more details uh, that you that you have and the more angles uh, from which you're able to view um, uh, an incident or a person, the, the better the, the outcome is going to be, the product is going to be. So, you know, a lot, a lot of research and then figuring out, okay, what, well, what is the way into this poem or into this this scene or into this story um, what is going to you know carry it from from the beginning to the the end of the poem what you know what is the what's the what is the through line or the or the golden thread that's going to um, going to provide a fresh perspective and or make the impact that I want it to make, or that the end, if it's a if it's uh, a biography, or that make have the impact that th this individual would want would want this this telling to to have. So, yeah, but but it all starts with with the research. All starts and with the research. Do you sit down and, and and make a sort of a formal outline or plan? No, I'm very informal. <laughs> I'm <laughs> very informal. I may at some point, um, you know, kind of do an out, not really an outline. I, I, I'm a note taker and a note, note maker. So I'm, I do post-it notes and I don't have them up on a wall or anything. They're kind of just on a desk, you know, I'll mix up with other post-it notes about other things. Um, I do sometimes uh, work in longhand, not very often, but sometimes I do. Um, when I was writing um, the Marilyn Monroe verse novel, I did a lot of that in longhand. Um, but no, I don't. I'm very. I'm relatively un. I'm relatively unstructured. Although I can work for long, you know, long periods of of, of time. Gotcha. Obviously, uh, no no sense asking if you're a pants or a plotter when you're writing uh, biographies or about history. You you know the plot going in. So, are what what's what's a successful day look like for you on like a book like Box? Where you're writing a, a, a series of poems to, to tell a story, um, I'm I'm assuming you're not going by word count to judge that. Or do you? How much of your time in a day are you setting aside for writing? And then what's what's a successful day look like? A successful day is um, maybe when I've finished my research and can actually write. And then uh, if I'm writing, if I'm working on a poetry manuscript, uh, uh, now Box is a bit different because Box was, is, set, is sestets, uh, six line poems. And usually I'm not working in a form that, that's quite that compact, even though my work is spare, it's usually not that spare. 
Uh, so box was a different, you know, different case. Uh, but yeah, generally, uh, with with uh, you know a page long poem, maybe I'm able to get one poem or two poems done in a day. So with a book like box, are we talking a couple of months before you have a, a full draft that you're happy with, or what's your? Average? I've worked on box off and on for probably seven or eight years. Oh, I'm uh, dreaming with yeah. the box, <laughs> <laughs> but not, but. It, it was not in its current form. And, um, actually, it was uh, it, it was delayed. Let's put it that way. It was delayed, and then I got back into it and decided that it was going to rather than uh, rather than uh, going to be a, a a picture book with you know just a continuous poem, a book length poem, that it was going to be a series of poems. And then, you know, so I began re-envisioning it that way. And I'm not sure whether, I'm not sure when I came up with the concept for the, um, the, the six, you know, having the, the, the cubic structure um, shape the poems. Uh, but I, I did eventually come up with that and decided that not only would the poems, uh, would, the, would the poems each have six lines, I wanted the number of poems in the book to be divisible by six. <laughs> <laughs> so I really like nerded out completely, um, but I, I'm not sure. I'm not sure it worked out in terms of the number of poems being divisible by six. But I think it might. If anybody wants to check, uh, if you leave out the 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 first poem, which is the concrete poem, the number six, and possibly leave out the last poem, it, I think there'll there'll be forty eight poems. Divisible by six. Is that just something that, that, that you felt that, that, that felt right? What what is it that yes. makes a decision like well, that? Well 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 Henry Brown Henry Box Brown shipped himself to freedom in a wooden box. And that box had six sides. And so I wanted to uh you know come up with a form that or use a form that reflected the cubic structure of the box. I also thought that the form fit the story because the the six line structure constrained me as I wrote it. And the six line structure, the box, uh, you know, represents uh, not only uh, Henry's, Henry Box Brown's confinement within that box while he was being shipped, but his confinement and oppression when he, when he was under the yoke of slavery. So, you know, that's, that's what the, you know, the six line structure, you know, represents and, and evokes. And, you know, I just, I just thought that the six line structure felt, you know, organically right for the project. I suppose over seven to eight years, you could probably have a lot of different thoughts about a, about a story. But no, I think you're writing on a level that I'm just not at. That blows my mind. That's <laughs> something else. Uh, I did want to ask, uh, so a quote that I saw uh, from you is that you, you said your books are tailor-made for critical reading uh, for elementary students. Uh, so right away, I wanted to make sure I asked you, how do you do that? How do you make sure that you, you, you set yourself up for a book that's going to be useful in the classroom for that critical reading, as well as uh, speak the, the, the truth of the story and, and, and fulfill you as an artist? Well, again, you know, start with you have to start with research because I'm, I'm doing uh, writing nonfiction. And, you know, you do have a, a responsibility to, um, you know, be factual and to be um, uh, as as authentic as possible. So, you know, it starts with the research and then, you know, you have to, in, in the telling of the, of the story, uh, regardless of the genre, uh, there has to be artistry involved because you want the book to be quality, quality literature. I teach children's literature, so I, quality literature is something, a, phrase, a term that we use, um, you know, in my, in my class, classroom. Uh, so you want it to be, you know, you want you want the style to have, you know, some originality and some artistry, and then then and and also uh, in in terms of my books, in terms of my books being tailor made for critical literacy, 
you know, I, I, because I write about these tough topics that do beg questions, you know, that's where, you know, that's where the critical literacy comes in, but they're not going to, you know, if, if the other two pieces, other two components, the artistry and the, the, uh, you know, responsibility through that to, to be well-researched are not in place, then you're not going to get to the point where teachers will present it and, you know, and say, okay, let's read this book and then we can talk about it. So you need a good story first, then worry about whether or not you've uh, <laughs> you've taught anybody anything. Um, and I notice you've got a, a number of study guides available at your your website. And otherwise, I don't know if you're doing that or somebody's doing that on on your behalf. But it seems like just a wonderful opportunity for any teachers who are listening to this who are wondering how will I cover the Tulsa Race Massacre. Good news, <laughs> we we can point you toward resources available. <laughs> And I do have, be sure to check out um, what I call the, I think it's called, I think the little guide is called Black History Books. That's the short title, but it's really a bibliography of my books, an annotated bibliography that also has those, some of those same links uh, as, and, and has, um, there's a chart in the back that lists all my books, indicates what um, subject matter, uh, what uh, theme, what subject area the book is linked to, and also the grade levels that it's appropriate for. So, you know, teachers can, can look at that, uh, educators can look at that chart and say, oh yeah, this book about, you know, this book, uh, Sugar Hill, uh, Harlem's Historic Neighborhood is for ages, I see it's for ages four to eight, and it connects to uh, music, social studies, and language arts. So it's, a, you know, it's a real handy guide. And they can download that from the site, from that page as well. So it's cbweatherford.com and go to the uh, resources page. You're just making it as easy as humanly possible for teachers to, to use your books in the classroom, right? Yes, yes. That, I mean, that's, teachers have enough work to do. I'm one of them. So, I mean, I, I teach at the, at the university so that you really, you know, you probably can't compare what I do to a K through 12 classroom teacher, because I think they work much harder than, than university uh, professors do. Uh, but yeah, I know, I know, you know how it feels to have uh, a lot of students and have papers to grade and you know, taking your job home with you. So I, I empathize teachers. Well, how many? I mean, you've been publishing children's books, uh, specifically picture books, since what, the 1995, I think, was when... Uh, 1995, my first book came out, right. Juneteenth Jamboree. How many, I mean, how many school visits, how many child events could would you estimate you've been doing a year since? I did more before I started teaching at the university, and I've been teaching there since 2002. So I used to do, you know, maybe 30 a year. Uh, but, but now, you know, maybe I'm doing 10 a year, not, and not that many this year, 10 or 15 a year, you know, in a, in a, in a usual year. Um, I don't, it's not that I don't want to do it, but I don't have the time to promote it the way that I used to promote it. Well, these days, what, uh, what are you finding to be the most effective forms of marketing for your books? Hmm. That's a good question. You know, I, I, I spent many years in public, in public relations. And the thing about anything but paid advertising is hard to measure. So I think that, I mean, social media now, I don't think you can, an author can afford to ignore social media. Uh, that has a... a uh, it's a it's, it's a place where people can talk about your talk about your book, and where, and thus where other people can perhaps hear about a book that's that they're not aware of that they might want to want to purchase. So that's that's important, uh, and this kind of content is important as well, I believe. And and as more and more of of this type of content, the uh, podcast uh, and webinars are created. Uh, and and put out there the the more important I think it's going to become. So yeah, definitely you know social media, digital media uh, is 
a big piece of it. But probably the probably the most effective way, and it's the way that I have not totally tapped in into, is to um, have people subscribe to your blog or to your web or to your newsletter, and to have your own list of of people that you are in touch with directly through email. I think that's that's a good way. And and once the pandemic's over, um, maybe you know maybe we'll see some more creative face to face events as well. So I think you know I think the more creative I think you know really creative book launches are good are, are wonderful. I've never been the best at that, but <laughs> but I've been to some really good ones. Well, whatever uh, whatever you've done has obviously been extremely effective. In fact, I, I had seen a thing where you mentioned that you were doing pretty well. You, you had Juneteenth Chamboree and some other books, but then it's Moses, uh, the, the Harry Tugman book that, that, that you said propelled your career to another level. Obviously, that one's uh, – was that one the first Caldecott or was that Freedom and Congress? Right. That was the first Caldecott. Right. Kadir, so Nel- illustrated by Kadir Nelson. What uh, what happened with Moses that that was a game changer for you? Well, I think it was I think it was the Caldecott, and I think it was uh, the publisher's invest initial investment in the book. Uh, so I, you know, I just think it, the Caldecott did it, and I don't know. I, I I think it was that, and 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 Harriet Tubman's also this you know really um, you know legendary, um, enduring you know enduring figure. And so the, they're probably her name. Apparently, it probably helped to have her name for the book to have been about her. Sure. So yeah, so that you know, at that point, I think people, at least people in the industry, knew my name. Then now you're you're going out to events and and, and people are saying, "Hey, Carol Boston Weatherford." Uh, we 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 loved your book. Come sit at our table. Let's 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 talk about other uh, book options you might have. Something something similar to that. <laughs> yeah, and I say, are you are you buying? <laughs> <laughs> no, that of hasn't happened. No, that hasn't that, that hasn't now, happened. The drinks yet. are free. <laughs> 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 I assume. I hope to find out someday. But I assume. Yeah, I know. <laughs> Oh, I told well. people. I, I told people. I've told people. I'm. I'm probably going to cry when I go to a restaurant again. I'm a foodie, and I'm not. You know. Well, you know. It's been. It's been a, over a year. My cooking skills have have, have dramatically improved. Uh, fortunately, we don't have Mrs. Canton here, so uh, she, she 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 might she might undercut that a bit. But I think they've improved, and certainly her. <laughs> well, that's all that matters. <laughs> I, I I feel that I'm I'm eating better things when I cook, so good good enough. Yeah, um, good. I don't want to I don't want to take up too much of your time because I I know you've already had a, a long day, and I appreciate your your being generous with your time for me now. Uh, but I do have just a couple of other questions that I wanted to make sure I ask. One a quote that I saw from you that I, I just can't let go. You said that the creator called you to be a poet. Why do you think that, and what responsibility does that bring with it? Well, I think that I was called to be a poet because I've had a couple poems in my lifetime come out of the blue. And the first poem that came out of the blue, so to speak, and and to come in a piece as well and not, you know, not have to revise, which is very, very, very unusual. I, you know, I always, as I, as I told you, I can work on something for seven years and the longest amount of time is like, I worked on something off and on for 20 years, one manuscript. Anyway, anyway, I've had two poems that came to me in a piece out of the blue. The first one was the poem that I composed in first grade and dictated to my mom on the way home from school. And I think that poem was God's way of getting my parents' attention and letting them know that they had a child who had a gift and that that gift, you know, that gift was writing poetry. So my dad was a high school, uh, was a high school printing teacher and printed uh, my early, some of my early poems on the printing press in his classroom. And, you know, so what were the chances of that? You know, this little poet child being born to um, educators and, you know, one of them, you know, notices, the, identifies the talent and the other prints the early poems on the uh, early poems on the press in his classroom. So that was the first thing. The second poem that came out of the blue was called I'm Made of Jazz. 
And at the time that I wrote it, I was about 20, 22, 23 years old. And I had never written a poem that long. And as I said, it, it was three, it was three pages long and it came to me in a piece and I did not, I never revised it, but I did send it out to a magazine. I sent it out to a city magazine that's now defunct. It was called uh, Metropolitan Magazine in Baltimore. And that was the end of that. Until I went to the dentist office and saw, and saw Metropolitan Magazine and picked it up and there was the poem. They had not even told me that they published it. But, <laughs> but I was thrilled. <laughs> Absolutely thrilled. The only problem was that I had um, just accepted a fellowship to go to graduate school. Uh, and the fellowship was, uh, it was a full ride and I went ahead to graduate school and I went to one class. I, oh, I also, uh, first of all, I went past my, I was supposed to have it being uh, a, T, a TA. So I went, or a research assistant, RA. So I went past my, the professor's na uh, office to get this stack of papers. I can't even remember what I was supposed to do with them, but it was, you know, it was about something like that. And I got that. And went to one class and decided, I'm a poet. I don't belong here. And so I left the program. Left the <laughs> I turned my back. <laughs> I, I, I walked away from the fellowship and subsequently ended up putting myself through graduate school twice. Uh, once for publications design and the second time for an MFA in creative writing. But I think that that poem that came out of the blue about jazz that got me out, made me leave graduate school and make my parents think I had lost my mind was God letting me know that I was supposed to be a poet, that, you know, I had this gift and that was what I was supposed to pursue. So does that factor in when you're making your decisions about what you're going to write next? I mean, this is a gift from God that's been entrusted to you or is the act of your wanting to write a poem, does that give you the, the, the idea that, oh, well, this, I'm naturally attracted to this subject, therefore that must be in alignment with that will? Mm, maybe half and half. You know, I, I, like, I like to think that, well, first of all, I don't write about any, anything I don't care about or you know, any, any subject I don't care about, and I don't write about um, any subject whom I don't admire. Because I have to, I don't know how long I'm going to have to live live with that with that subject, and you know, through research and through the you know the crafting of the manuscript. So, I I do try to, I do you know, I do bring that kind of attitude toward um, an approach to every project. So now, whether you know whether every project's ordained or not, that's is probably beyond me to say. But there um, have been, but there are mystical things that that transpire sometimes in the course of writing about uh writing about a subject go on what's an example of ah i knew we weren't going to end just yet we can't end just <laughs> yet. Yeah, <laughs> okay for for example when uh i have a book called the beatitudes from slavery to civil rights and there's a spread in the beatitudes uh in which uh fannie lou hamer appears the, the book it just has each, each spread is a different scene or a different historical figure uh, from African-American history. And the premise is that God was with uh, these, was with African-Americans. It was with, the, with these historical figures throughout every step of the freedom struggle. And so the, the manuscript is written, the, the text is written in the voice of God. And so on this, in this spread where Fannie Lou Hamer is, she's shaking a tambourine. And the last line is God is where God says what his role was or what her role was. And the line is, I shook the tambourine. And Fannie Lou Hamer is, is pictured, you know, shaking this tambourine. Anyway, whenever I would read that spread, I would get goosebumps. My, my the, you know, the hairs on my arms would just, you know, just rise, rise up. Until I decided that I was going to write about Fannie Lou Hamer and wrote Voice of Freedom, Fannie Lou Hamer, The Spirit of the Civil Rights Movement, which is illustrated by Aqua Holmes. And that's the second or the third Caldecott. I can't, I get mixed up. I think that's the, the, the second Caldecott that um, Aqua got a Caldecott honor for that one. Anyway, after that book came out, 
my hairs didn't, my hair, I didn't get goosebumps anymore when I was reading that spread from Beatitudes. So I believe that the goosebumps were, were Fanning New Hamer's way of getting my attention and letting me know that I needed to write that book. Because I did have, you know, I had mentioned, I had, you know, put it out into the ethers that I, that I wanted to write a book about Fanning New Hamer, but I hadn't, you know, I really hadn't started on it. But I kept getting these, you know, these goosebumps, and I said, "Okay, I got to do. I've got to write about it." So that was pretty, pretty common that you'll you'll feel drawn to a subject, and then it's not, it's not goosebumps and and all of that every time. But no, does, it's not that, goosebumps every good? time. No, it's not goosebumps every time. Um, with there, you know, there are a few uh, subjects that. I'm drawn to in in strange in stranger ways, but you know, usually I am drawn to the subject, but it's not you know not always mystical. But there is an element of of writing. At least I found it to be true. That's I, what I imagine divining water must be like for for folks when you've got your stick and no water here, no water here. Oh, I can feel it. This is this is where right. it is. Right. Yeah, exactly. You know, channeling the voices and, you know, maybe that's not the right voice. That's right. Oh, there you are. There you are. Yeah, there is some of that that goes on. Very much so. And, you know, when you have figured out the approach that you want to take to the subject, um, you know, the, um, you know, the, the style in which you want to write, the, the voice, uh, the point of view, and then everything's just, you know, all the pistons are running. That's, that's when, that's when I'm, when I'm in the zone. Well, I should uh, quit while I'm ahead, but esteemed audience knows, because I ask everybody every week this question, and I don't want them thinking I chickened out just because it's Carol Boston Weatherford. Um, have you ever seen a flying saucer and or a ghost? I've never seen a flying saucer, but I have had visions that I thought were spirits or ghosts. And actually, one of the ghosts that I saw, I, I can't, I wish I could remember the name. If I had known you were going to ask me that, I would have looked up the name of it. I saw this, this spirit. And then a few years later, I was at a lecture and the artist was showing uh, some African uh, costumes that are used for, and also West Indian costumes that were used for particular specific dances in in, in various in a, in a specific ritual, and it looked just like the person. They said, "This is the spirit, the, the you know the spirit so and so." I was like, "That's what I saw." <laughs> uh, I like I like your stories because they lead to more books. Yeah, <laughs> that's the best. Yeah, I'm gonna have to remember. I, I need. I wish I could call that. That it was something. It was a name like it. What the name was a squishy wishy, but it was something like jishy wishy or something. I can't remember the name of the spirit. Well, I want to ask about uh, Pokemon because I think it's just so awesome that you got Pokemon to, to change their their nefarious ways. But I can see that we should probably call it a night with my. And we can talk about we can talk okay. about that real quick. We can talk about that real quick. Is it, is it satisfying to have gone out and to have what? Well, what was the stupid character's name? I, I looked it up. I looked up the. Original, um, I can't even believe that oh was gosh, so happy. It's just late. I can't even think of the other character. Jinx, Jinx. Jinx the Pokemon. Yes. And the other Jinx one was Mister po Mister Popo out of Dragon Ball Z. There were two characters. And you wrote op eds, and you can you you made concrete change. One in the world. one one op ed. Oh, one op-ed for both. One op-ed, I know, but the but the same op-ed appeared in a few. It was picked up by some, you know different papers, and then after I wrote this op-ed saying that the characters appeared racist, one I said one character they looked like a, a one looked like a, a, a sambo character, and after uh, maybe a year or two afterwards, I mean I I wasn't even tracking it. I just I, at the time I used to write op eds, and that that was the op ed that I chose to write about. You know, that day when I sat down to write, and so uh, the uh, Sony actually pulled a couple episodes of Pokemon featuring this character, and then they changed the character's color from from black to purple. So does that feel good? Like I I did that. I made that different. I don't follow you know, Pokemon. It, it happened. Never, but, no, but, but wow. 
I mean, I guess it should. I guess it should feel good, but I, you know, I don't know if I care enough. My kids don't watch Pokemon anywhere anymore. <laughs> I spent a lot of money on those Pokemon cards for my kids. <laughs> So, I mean, I feel good that my kids are out of that stage. Uh, but, yeah, I, you know, I guess it accomplishes something, you know, that this character is no longer, uh, the, the racist-looking character is no longer in the in the series. So, yeah, I, I did accomplish that. And who well, knows? I Maybe, I mean, according to the, you know, internationally, that's probably the most important thing I've ever done. That's awesome. actually, I mean, I'm, I'm serious. That, that's, I bet you anything. Well, I probably, maybe, maybe my children's literature career has eclipsed that now. But for a long time, that would be like the top thing that would come up when you search for my name, search my, for my name. And actually, my, the Wikipedia entry uh, attributes much more to me than I deserve in terms of that, that controversy. And, you know, affecting that change. Because I did, you know, I wrote one thing and they, I think they said I did something about the toothpaste. I didn't do anything about the toothpaste other than point out that it was, you know, th that the company had a racist image. So there was a toothpaste called Dar Darkie Toothpaste. And they changed the name from Darkie to Darley. With that name, I don't even, I don't know what the, the image looks like, but just the name alone. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. So, but yeah. Yeah, there's even a Facebook page of, of, of Pokemon fans uh, who hate me. Oh wow! I'm serious. I believe it. It's called it's called Carol Carol Boston Weatherford is a racist. That's what it's called. Well, after people are, are look at that and are horrified, where can they find you online uh, in, a, <laughs> in a better light and and, and uh, find out more about you and follow you on social media and all that good stuff? Yeah, you can find the real Carol Boston Weatherford at cbweatherford.com, on Twitter as Poet Weatherford, on Facebook and Instagram as Carol Weatherford. This has been an absolute pleasure. I, I appreciate you making time. Uh, my final question is always some variation of this, and then we'll, we'll call it a night. Uh, but I always ask if there was some bit of information you could go back and give to yourself at any stage of along the way in your writing career that would have made your path easier. It might make easier the paths of all the writers listening to us now. What would you go back and tell yourself? Figure out what you want to do as early as possible. As young as, young as possible. Not necessarily as a child, but maybe in your 20s. I think that's the perfect note to end on. Uh, Carol Boston Weatherford, thank you again for a wonderful conversation. Uh, esteemed audience, as always, head to middlegradeninja.com for interviews with thousands of literary agents, editors, authors, all the best people. Download your free copy of Banneker Bones and the Giant Robot Bees. And God willing, I'm alive. I'll see you next week.